You want to try this one? All right. Good morning. It's funny because we're talking about technology this morning and it's not working like we want it to. I'm pretty sure Satan dwells in sound systems. Pretty sure of that. If you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to the first book of the Old Testament, Genesis? We're going to look at several verses this morning, chapter 1, chapter 10, and chapter 11. We're beginning a new series this morning entitled Connected. And so I want you to begin thinking about how technology is important to climbing the summit. And last Sunday was an amazing Sunday for our church as we begin this journey, this new day that we've been talking about, about the summit and how it illustrates a lifelong spiritual journey. And that's important for us to understand. It's important for us to connect with that. And as we think about domestic churches, here's the thought. As you think about being connected, you think about technology. Technology can either help or hurt us on the climb to the summit. It's one of those necessary evils, if you will, in our world today. It can be a help. It can get us along that journey. It can be one of the debris in our way, in our path on the climb to the top. And so I want to ask you as we begin, is your domestic church, your family, Connected to the source, Jesus Christ? Are you connected to one another? Or are you just connected to a device in your pocket or in your purse? And that's what I want you to begin to process as we go about the next four weeks of this idea of being connected. Now imagine with me a world where the cloud was something in the sky that produced rain. Imagine a world where something 4G describes where you parked your car at Walmart. Imagine a world where being linked in is actually being on a prison chain gang. Or a world where an app is something you fill out for college or for a job. You see, this world that I'm describing to you is our world about five or seven years ago. Our world, our our language, our codes, they've all changed dramatically in a short period of time. And new devices come out so fast. You'll probably see a commercial sometime today during the Super Bowl of something new that is coming out. Back up a little further and imagine a world where Amazon is just a river in South America. Or a world where being broke down on the side of the road meant you had to wait for someone to extend kindness to you and then pick you up and take you to a payphone to call for help. Imagine a world where you have dinner out and never hear the sound of a phone ringing, but you did have to put up with the smell of smoke. You remember that world? That was our world about 10 to 15 years ago. And so until our day, technological progress happened at a much slower rate of speed. Now, technological advances have altered the current generation, and they've changed the course of our culture. And we have to understand that. We have to accept that. Your phone, your computer, and your car are out of date the moment you leave the store or drive off the lot. They're out of date. And the question we have to learn to ask ourselves is this. What do I need one of these devices for? What do I need this for? Or another good question is, how will this device, how will this technological advance change the dynamics of my life or my domestic church for good or for bad? How is this device going to change everything? And when you begin to think about it and you begin to answer that question, then you can begin to think, do I really need this? Is technology helping me Or is it hurting me? 
Is it keeping me connected or is it disconnecting me from the world in which I live in? My domestic church. Some of us remember when families had one screen in the house. What screen was that? A TV, right? And we had one of those TVs that was like a large piece of furniture. And it took five people to move it. These big cabinet TVs. And as I thought about that, I was reminded, I kind of reminisced, I went back in my mind a little bit. Our TV, as it, as it aged, it was one of those tube TVs, when the screen would all of a sudden just kind of go to one line. And you'd have to walk over to that cabinet and whack it real hard, and then it jerked back out, you know, and you could get the full screen again. You've been there. You know what I'm talking about. You remember being your dad's remote? <laughs> click, 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 click. Is that what you want, Pop? Nope, keep going. You were your dad's remote? I remember the first VCRs that came out. My teenagers today don't even know what VCR means, you know. But I remember the first VCRs that came out, and they had a remote, but it was on a cord, you know. And if you got too far away from it and the cord broke, guess what? You're now the VCR remote play. We got lazy real quick, didn't we? How many screens do you have in your domestic church today? Pause for a minute. Count them up in your head. How many screens do you have? We have a lot. And I'm not talking about window screens. The sad reality is we are more connected than ever before, yet we are more isolated than ever before. We can multitask like nobody else. But then we wonder why we're so tired, how we got so busy, and how we have no time for anything of kingdom value. But, oh, we're connected. Or are you really? If I were guessing, you may have been asked in the commons one of two questions this morning. How are you? Or how is your family? And a typical response that you hear at Bacon Heights or any Heights Church or Walmart, Target, or anywhere you shop, somebody says, how are you or how's your family? I'm tired and I'm busy. We're always tired and busy. We build coffee shops on every corner of our towns so we can get our caffeine fix in order to maintain our tired and busyness. In 1997, a survey of kids, 9 to 12 years old, was asked to rank their values. 1997. Number 15 on their list of values was fame. A few years ago, that same survey was taken by 9 to 12 year olds. And the number one value on that list was fame. In a short period of time, it jumped from 15 to number one. And let me tell you why that has happened. Technology. You see, YouTube, if you're not familiar with this, you can go and watch any sermon that I've ever preached on YouTube. You're welcome. It'll put you right to sleep. But YouTube has changed the world into thinking that everyone is a star. Recently, Forbes magazine posted the top paid, are you ready? Top paid YouTube stars in 2015. People are making millions of dollars on YouTube. And so in order to make this list in Forbes magazine, you had to net at least $2.5 million. There's a lady named Rosanna Pensino who teaches baking tutorials on YouTube and makes $2.5 million a year. Two guys who receive their engineer degrees 
named Rhett and Link, who have now turned into these YouTube comedians, are making $4.5 million a year on YouTube. A group called Smosh, know nothing about them, other than they, they do live action skits of Pokemon, they're making $8.5 million a year on YouTube. And are you ready? The number one YouTube star in 2015. You'll see him on the screen. His name is PewDiePie, a guy who plays video games. And he has 35 million subscribers, 8 billion views on YouTube, and he makes $12 million a year. It's time for the church. It's time for us as believers, as followers. We've got to take a step back when it comes to technology. And so I want you to look at some verses with me this morning, and I want to help you understand what this title of the sermon is all about. Don't be a Nimrod. Look at Genesis chapter 1. And we need to go back so that we can understand what it means not to be a Nimrod. And so in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, here's what we read as God has created the earth. It says, God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, or maybe your translation says, have dominion over it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Here's the first thought this morning about being connected to the proper source, learning not to be a nimrod when it comes to technology, is you have dominion. You have dominion. When God created the earth, he basically began giving out jobs. Birds were given the job to soar, but they should be careful flying over the state of Texas. Right? Fish were given the job to swim. Stars were given the job to shine. And people, male and female, you and me, were given the job to show. Let me explain that. We were created in the image of God. And so our job is to show the world who God is. Our job is to be image bearers of God. The one who created us. The one who gave breath and life to us. That's our job that God handed out to us on the day of creation. And God says... You go show others who I am. I created you in my image. Now you go show other people who I am. Nothing can bear the image of Christ other than us. We've been given dominion. We've been given the privilege to subdue the earth. To subdue technology, not for technology to have dominion and subdue us. Do you have dominion over technology? Or does technology have dominion over you? You have to answer that question today. Because that will determine where and how you are connected. You see, technology has a lot to do with dominion over the earth. When man or woman goes from being an image bearer to being an image maker, we have flipped the roles and abandoned our responsibilities in the job that we've been given. You see, when the hierarchy in our lives is out of order, when our priorities are out of balance, Things go wrong. 
And things operate best. You and me, we operate best when we surrender to the way God set the world in motion and not try to redirect it all together. Any addiction, you name it, any addiction is about flipping the hierarchy in your life. Healing is found when things are in proper order. When you begin to understand your job and your role of having dominion over the earth and being an image bearer of Jesus Christ. You see, we no longer want to serve God. We want to be God. And that's the greatest danger in technology today. Because we're not using it to serve the Lord. We're using it to flip the hierarchy and to place ourselves in a position that we were never meant to be in. And part of salvation, part of coming to faith in Jesus Christ, part of being a follower of Jesus Christ is giving Jesus back His proper place. It's giving Jesus back his seat. You see, we make terrible gods. And the hierarchy of technology is that you have dominion over your phone. It does not have dominion over you. And you should take a deep breath. You should find freedom in knowing you don't have to answer that call. You don't have to respond to that text message. You don't have to check email every five minutes. We must not allow our devices to subdue us. We have to disconnect in order to connect. And so what image do you see looking back at you in all of those screens that you have in your house? Is it your image? Or is it the image of God? Know your role. Know your job. How you were created. And out of that, you begin to connect to your domestic church, and to the relationships that really matter. We don't want to be YouTube stars. We want to point people to the star, the true, one, living, holy God. Let me show you what happens when we fail to have dominion over the earth when it comes to technology. Look in chapter 10 of Genesis. We're also going to look in chapter 11, so be ready to turn the page this morning. I want to share with you a story about a man named Nimrod. In Genesis chapter 10, beginning in verse 8, we begin to see this person of Scripture known as Nimrod. And now Cush became the father of Nimrod. And he became a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalnea in the land of Shinar. Now turn to chapter 11 and let's watch to see what happens in Nimrod. Chapter 11, Genesis, beginning in verse 1. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east and they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. And they came and said, Come let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into the heavens. 
So you learn that you have dominion over the earth. You subdue it. Technology doesn't subdue you. Here's a second thought as we look at this man named Nimrod. You make the decisions. You make the decisions. To understand technology, you have to understand the person of Nimrod. See, Nimrod was a famous king who built a tower, the Tower of Babel. And he saw how he could use technology of his day for evil rather than for good. And so he made bricks rather than using stones. And I I brought a brick this morning. This actually is a brick that came from my uh, grandparents' house in Midland. And so this brick not only reminds me of my family and my legacy and and my heritage, but it has a symbolism this morning as we think about technology. You see, what Nimrod did wasn't bad. It's what he did with what he made. And so he has this brick. He doesn't use stone because stone doesn't stack as well as brick, does it? And so he takes bricks and they make them, they burn them, they form them, and they begin to build a tower. So it's not the brick that's bad. It's what he does with the brick that's bad. You see, the brick and the iPhone really have great similarities. The iPhone's not bad. It's what you do with the iPhone that makes it bad. You make the decision. See, the decision to to make the brick was not bad. It's that he'd made the decision to build a tower. The same is true with with your iPhone or your iPad or any other device you might have. We think that technology companies and technology itself is bad. But guess what? We're the ones to blame. That we have to own that. We, we have to understand that we have dominion and we make the decisions when it comes to technology. Nimrod tries to exercise dominion, though, in a faithless manner. He was the poster child for technology and using technology in a destructive way. And so now you know, and you have freedom now this morning. And when you leave from this place later today and you're driving to lunch or back to your house and you see one, someone texting and driving, you have freedom to say, that person's a nimrod. <laughs> but how are you being a nimrod when it comes to using technology? It's not that either one of these things are bad. It's what you do with them. And you make the decision in that. Nobody else has control over that. Nobody else has dominion over you. You do. And how are you trying to be God? And use technology to advance your purposes rather than the pers- purpose of God on this earth. You see, in some ways, when you think about it, the story and the account of Adam and Eve and the account of Nimrod draw strong similarities when you put them side by side. Why? Because both stories show people acting pridefully by trying to make themselves God-like. That's what Nimrod did. Nimrod wasn't trying to build this impressive tower. Nimrod was trying to reach heaven. Nimrod wanted to be God. And when you think about it, your pride says the same thing. And so are you using technology for good or for destructive purposes? You make that call. You make that decision. Facebook is a fun way to connect with people in our past, but Facebook is also used for destructive purposes. You understand that? Bullying is at an all-time high on Facebook for teenagers, for young people. Technology has become a weapon of mass destruction of our day. 
and one-third of divorces in our world are said to be directly related to Facebook. One-third. I'm not good at math, but that's one out of every three. Because some people use Facebook to connect to someone they are not married to. And that's a problem. And you can read a lot of negativity on Facebook. And you begin to realize that there are a lot of nimrods on social media. Don't be one. Don't be a nimrod when it comes to social media. Be smart what you post or repost or say. I've said this several times for some reason the last several days to different audiences and avenues, even to my own family members over the phone. You understand that the English language was never meant to be written. It was meant to be spoken. Because when you put something in writing, the person reading it determines and interprets what you say. Here's the difference between English and Greek and Spanish. You look at the Spanish language and the English language. Whatever Spanish word you use, depending on where it falls in the sentence and what accent marks you use over that word determines the fluctuation of the voice, what the meaning of the word is, and then it tells the person what you're saying. We have none of those things in the English language. And so the danger of a text message or an email and even a letter, though you might preface it by saying, Please understand what I'm about to say. Or please don't read into too much of what I'm saying. Even though you say that, it's left up to the person who reads it to determine how you said it and what you meant. And we become nimrods because our language was meant to be spoken. It was meant to be face-to-face conversations. So people see our body language and our facial expressions and they hear the influctuation of our voices and they know exactly our heart and our passion and our intent. Don't be a nimrod when it comes to social media because you not only hurt yourself, you hurt your domestic church and you hurt your local church. Look at the last couple of verses in chapter 11 this morning that we'll look at. Picking up back in verse 4 and reading through verse 9. So they said, come let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people. And they all have the same language, even though we can't all speak that language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Verse 7. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth. And they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Our final thought this morning as we think about connecting is that you can change the direction. You have dominion. You make the decision. And you can change the direction. It's not too late to change the course of technology in our world and generation today. We're close. But we can change the direction. You see, when the people arrive in their new home at Shinar, they decide to have a building project. Now, it's not an expansion project like we're going to do. They wanted to build a whole new city. Let's reestablish everything. A new language. And the biggest problem was their motives. 
They wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to be YouTube stars of their day. It was all about fame. And as they do this, they became people who ignored God and were that close to being like the people of Shinar and a bunch of nimrods when it comes to technology. At Babel, they declared their independence from God. We can take care of ourselves. We've got all the technology at our fingertips that we need. We can be God. You see, you and I have dominion, but all authority belongs to God, not us. Scripture says all have fallen short of the glory of God. And that includes Nimrod and the people of Shinar. Technology has changed the direction of our lives. It's changed our domestic churches. It's changed many of our relationships. Some for the better. Some for the worse. And verbal conversations have declined because we talk more with our thumbs than we do with our mouths. But we can change that direction. We can use technology to climb the summit. We can use technology to make good decisions. This morning, we have 11 new resources at the launch center for you. They're going to help you avoid being a Nimrod and help you connect on a heart level with your domestic church, with your kids and your grandkids. And I want to share two of those with you as we close. The first one that you'll find out in the launch center this morning is our 3D brochure. And in here, you'll begin to understand what it means to be connected, that you would um, disconnect to connect, that you would deepen your internal values, and that you would develop external boundaries. And so this would be a good place to start as you think about technology and you think about being connected and Scripture here for you to follow and a good thing for you and your family, your domestic church, to process through. But we just want, don't want to give you this. We want to give you so much more. And so there's also, in the launch center this morning, a family contract that you can use. And it gives a little bit of an explanation on the front. And then on the inside, you decide. Uh, all of, You can check different boxes and then sign it. And then on the back as well, everybody understands and, and is accountable to this contract. And everybody signs it at the bottom. And you can keep this as a family somewhere that's prominent for you to see. And everybody knows this is what's involved when it comes to technology in our family. This is a little more in-depth than what Heather and I did several years ago, but our oldest daughter, Hallie, is going to be 15 in a couple of months. And when she was 13, uh, we held her off that long. But when she was 13, she got a phone. And I signed the contract for her to have the phone at AT AT&T, but she signed a contract to get it from me. And it's a one-page, 18 points. (laughs) Not much room left at the bottom. For her mother and I and her to sign. And listen. We make the decisions. We determine the direction. And so you've got to ask yourself this morning. Two basic questions as we close. What problem does this device solve? Or what problem does it create? Because giving a child a phone to be quiet in a restaurant solves a noise problem, but it creates a parenting problem. And do you rule over your devices? Or do they rule over you? A phone is an accessory that has became a priority. And we have to flip that. We've become people of the ding. Where do you draw the line? 
When is it time to flip the hierarchy back to the proper order and find true connections to the true source? And when it comes to being connected, learn that we can't be a bunch of nimrods. You have dominion. You make decisions. And together we can change the direction of technology. All for the good. But we have to be connected on a heart level with the people in our lives. Let me pray for you this morning. Father, it's a privilege to be in this place at this time and to understand that a time such as this has come for the followers of Jesus Christ to right the wrongs of technology that we have created. We have allowed them to dictate our lives. We have allowed them to determine how we live. They've made decisions for us. We've given up our dominion to our devices. But I pray, God, that we take it back today. That we would know that it is our job as followers and Christians to be image bearers of the one true creator of this universe. You've given us responsibility, but all authority is yours. So God, help us make good decisions. Help us ask hard questions. Do I really need this device? Do I need another screen in my domestic church? Is this going to help? Is this going to solve a problem or create a problem? God, I pray we'd change direction. That we'd stop trying to be God-like and seek godliness. And return to you, the one who breathed life into us. Thank you for technology. Thank you for how it can help us advance the kingdom of God and climb the summit. But may we keep the hierarchy in proper order. So church family, in just a moment, we're going to stand and sing in a time of response. And Pastor Truman and Pastor Jim will be here to receive you. Maybe it's time to disconnect from all those devices and reconnect to the one who gives you life. Lord Jesus, have your way. We pray this in your name. Amen. Would you stand? Let's sing together. This is your time. You come.